difference between wheel training and ice training is the same difference like uh, walking and skating. There's no traction on the ice. It's terrible. Now, the luge track's almost a mile long. It's about three quarters of a mile long, about 15, 16 curves. And they start you off at the bottom. Everybody thinks you start at the top. No, that'd be murder, right? No, they start you at the bottom, like on curve 10, and you're going about 20 miles an hour. And you're just bang, 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 bang. I mean, nothing seems to work when you're first learning. And you just crash, 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 crash. And then finally you figure it out. So as soon as you figure it out, coach moves you up a couple of curves. Now you're going, you know, you're going 30 miles an hour. Well, 30 miles an hour, gosh, there's no time to think. Everything's so fast. Crash, 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 crash. Figure it out. Move you up a couple of curves. Now you're going 40, right? And you literally crash your way to the top. I mean, you do. Right? <laughs> it, it, it takes about 100 runs. If you're pretty good, it takes about 100 runs to get you to the top. Now you made it to the top, well, big deal. Now that just means you can drive a car, but you can't go and drive an Indy yet, right? So you have to perfect. You have to get it right. It's like you just learn a, 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 a brand new phrase to, to tell somebody about the business, but you haven't, you know, it's not yours yet, right? You haven't got the nuances yet, and you just need to practice, practice, practice. Hey, it may not work out the first 10 times, but it doesn't matter. You just keep on keeping on, and you perfect, and eventually it, it, it does become yours, and it starts working. be open to looking for opportunities, okay? A few years ago, back in 87, we're in St. Moritz, Switzerland, and I do the singles luge, but there's also a uh, doubles luge, okay? Doubles is two guys on a the sled, they're each doing half of the driving, but only the top guy can see, all right? The top guy's giving the bottom guy shoulder signals to tell him when to drive. <laughs> yeah, plus you gotta have, you, you got a higher uh, center of gravity so it's easier to flip. I mean, that's a crazy sport. And I've never done the doubles, but we go to St. Moritz, and we notice right away that, hey, there's nobody signed up for the doubles race. There's actually three, three teams, the, the, just three teams. So I figured, man, it, I got to find a double sled and find me a partner, because, hey, if somebody crashes, we got a medal, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, so I go to my, my buddy Pablo Garcia from Spain. And I told him, you know, hey, we got to sign up. He goes, hey, you know, Pablo's no dummy. He saw the opportunity. He says, yeah, let's do it. Well, we had to get permission from Coach. So we asked Coach. And Coach goes, look, if you guys can find a double sled in this town, you got my blessings. Well, it turns out that St. Moritz, even though they've got the luge track, they're a bobsled town. They don't like losers over there. There's only like one luge guy in all of Switzerland. They like bobsled. And so we spent three days cold calling in German. We don't speak German, but that's what they speak over there. We learned a little phrase. Haven't seen a double sitzer schlitten for the World Cup run. Slam, right? You have a double sled for the World Cup race. <laughs> Next door. Three days of cold calling, and finally we found a guy that had an old double sled, rusted out, 20-year-old sled in his backyard. He lent it to us. We got it race ready. We joined the race. Everybody lined up to watch Ruben and Pablo kill themselves. <laughs> and we almost did. I mean, we came close to crashing several times down that track, and we finished. We got fourth place, right? <laughs> I know, fourth place. Well, yeah, they, I, th I thought it was pretty great. Well, anyways, we go to the we, we, <laughs> we go to the closing ceremonies, right? The the medal ceremonies, and you know they got the podium first, second, third, and we just love seeing it. You know, watching those guys get their medals is just exciting. So we're sitting there watching, and the and the race organizers they they point to us. It goes, hey, you two, us? Yeah. So we walk right in front of the first place, right, right on the ground, and they gave us fourth place medals. <laughs> Can you believe that? I've been in the sport for 20 years. I've never seen a fourth place medal in my life. I actually tried, I, I checked it out. It wasn't chocolate or anything, right? It was real. <laughs> we got our pictures in the paper, and, at the, and we earned so many World Cup points for that fourth place finish that at the end of the whole season, we were ranked 14th in the world in the doubles. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we're, uh, we're at another track, and the word had spread like wildfire what, what Pablo and I had done. I said, you guys were lucky. We said, no, we weren't lucky. We saw an opportunity and we went for it. And that got them real quiet, right? And they understood that, wow, these guys, you know, they, they went for it. So go for it. So there's two types of people in the world. They're either on your team or they're not on your team. They're either on your dream team or they're not. And the faster you can figure out which team they're on, the better it is for you. So I started testing people, right? I would tell them a little bit about my dream and see how they reacted, right? And so I'd say, hey, I'm taking up the sport of losers. I'm going to be in the Olympics in four years. Oh, they laughed. They rolled their eyes. So they just, yeah, you, right. If they did that, I knew they, they probably weren't on my team. 
On the other hand, they said, wow, luge, Olympics, tell me more, how can I help? Wow, if I found somebody like that, that's like a gold person, right? And I held on to them like they're made out of gold. And by doing that over and over and over and over again, I could have filled this, this whole arena with people that were on my team. See, they were my supporters. And it got to the point where it didn't matter if I crashed four out of five times uh, on the sled, it was going to be easier to get back on that sled one more time than come back to Houston and tell everybody I quit. Because by then it was our dream. I just happened to be the guy on the sled. This huge conversion van, he, he, he drives it right in front of my, my, my house, opens up the window, starts yelling like a madman. I believe in you, baby. I'm going to see you on TV. You know why? Because you will be a three-time Olympian. And he peels off, there's smoke all over the place. And says, Whoa, man, I mow my lawn like I'm five minutes flat, right? And sometimes I go across the street and mow his lawn, too. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why he did it. I don't know. <laughs> but I'll go across the street and I, and I tell him, hey, Tom, I'm, I'm, I, I was chosen. I'm one of the selected ones. You know, I, I'm, going, I, I'm carrying the torch, Kansas City, in just, just about a month. And Tom knew I was broke. He knew I was so broke. Because everybody always asks me, you know, what, what's, who's your sponsor, Ruben? Coke? Pepsi? You know, Microsoft, I mean, who's your, Nike, ha, <laughs> right. My, my sponsors, Visa and MasterCard, my own, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he knew I was totally broke. And when I told him I'm going to Kansas City, he points to the big van, he goes, I'm driving you, buddy, road trip. He drove me 12 hours each way. My quarter mile in 10 minutes flat. <laughs> I look like a little old man. That's great. I got so, it, it took me so long, my arm got tired, I had to switch hands, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want the papers next day to say, Olympics canceled, Ruben dropped the torch, <laughs> right? <laughs> you get to the end, you light the next person's torch, a little high five, they turn around, and they take off. And I just sat there for about five minutes, watching that torch until it disappeared. And the next time I saw that flame, there I was at the opening ceremonies of the Salt Lake City Olympics, right? As a three-time Olympian. And I'm watching all my heroes bring it in, right? It's Dorothy Hamill, Peekaboo Street, and, and all, just all my heroes, Dan Jansen, and they're bringing it on. And then just a few yards in front of me, they pass it to, wouldn't you know it, Scott Hamilton. Yeah. God, little skater that, that inspired me to go after my dream 20 years earlier. I mean, man. I, I don't know what you're feeling right, right now, but I feel just like I felt that day. Proudest day of my life. Guys, if you have a dream, you're willing to go for it, you refuse to quit, and you hang on to your leadership, you can make that dream come true. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mr. Ruben Gonzalez! I've always been a for the last 30 years, I've been a student of success. And then I've listened to and I've done everything my Olympic coaches told me to do. And after all of that, I've come to the conclusion that success is really pretty simple. It comes down to finding an arena that you're suited to play in. Now, that's fancy talk for do something you're good at, something that, that you're passionate about. And then once you find that arena, you've got to have two types of courage. You've got to have the courage to get started. And at the beginning, it's always going to be tough. You're learning new skills, so you have to, you have to stick it out. You have to have the courage to, to not quit, the courage to endure. And along the way, you've got to have the attitude that, hey, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to get the job done. Success is simple, just not easy. It's hard to do all that stuff. It takes mental toughness. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to get mentally tough, how to get so tough inside that when you come across an obstacle that looks like Mount Everest, you've grown Right? You've developed yourself from inside out. All of a sudden, Mount Everest looks like a speed bump. See, if your obstacles look like Mount Everest, Mount Everest is huge. I mean, it's huge. You, it, you can't see behind Mount Everest. And so you lose sight of the, of the dream. As soon as, as soon as you lose sight of the dream, you get discouraged and you quit. But if you do things to build yourself up, you, heck, you could have 50 speed bumps. You can still see that dream. And then those speed bumps actually are there to help you out because they slow you down just long enough for you to learn a skill or learn a, a, a lesson that you needed to learn on the, to, to get to that destination. And once you learn it, pick up that key, stick it in your key ring. Before long, you got a key ring full of keys, right? You got experience. And that's when people start saying, you know, oh, you're lucky. <laughs> you got in at the right time. No, I just didn't quit. That's the whole difference. To get that courage to get started, you got to have, you have to build up your belief. 
And I know everybody here has heard, you know, what the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Oh, that sounds so pretty, doesn't it? <laughs> but if you don't believe in yourself, it's totally worthless. And so I'm going to teach you a couple of things you can do to boost up that belief level and things that work for me. If all you ever do is hang around people you have influence over, oh, you feel great. You're the big shot. You're like the big fish in a small pond. In Texas, where I live, it's like a big hat, but no cattle. <laughs> right? <laughs> Since if all you do is hang around them, nobody's pushing you to excel. And if you try to break out of the pack, they're going to pull you back because your success threatens them. He says, Ruben, you want to hang around successful people. You don't want to hang around winners. Successful people think big. They're always focusing on the dream. They're focusing on the, they're asking the right questions. You know, how are we going to get there? What do we need? What if? They're not focusing on the obstacles. Anybody can focus on the obstacles. They're really focusing on the dream. He says, Ruben, you want to hang around them. You'll feel uncomfortable. You'll feel out of place. You'll feel like you don't belong, but do it anyways. Force yourself to hang around those winners, because if you do, it'll rub off on you. And then you'll start thinking big. And when those people start believing in you, you'll start believing in yourself, because you respect their opinion. What's it feel like? What's it feel like to hurl yourself down an icy mountain at 80, 90 miles an hour? Is it scary? Yes, it's scary. <laughs> it's awful, awful. After all, I didn't get started until I was 21. Most luge guys, they get started when they're 10 years old. 10 year olds are bulletproof. But I got started at 21, so I've been doing the luge for 20 years now. I've got thousands of runs under my belt, and I'm still scared after every single run. The luge track, it's a, it's a shoot of ice that starts 50 stories up the mountain. 50 stories! I mean, that's way up there. <laughs> You're going to be sliding down that mountain on a little bitty sled. It's just a piece of fiberglass and a couple of steel runners. You know you're going to be hitting speeds of 80, 90 miles an hour, and you got no brakes! <laughs> I mean, does this sound normal so far? <laughs> Over the years, I've broken my, my foot twice, my knee, my elbow, my hand, my thumb, a couple of ribs. Whenever I crashed, if I crashed four times in a day and I was hurting everywhere, sometimes I might have to walk up and down that track for 30 minutes saying, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner. I'm not a quitter, I never quit, I'm going to make it to the Olympics. I can do it if I don't quit. And after long enough doing that, I could go up to the coach and say, okay coach, let's do it, I'm ready to do it again. Get to go to the Olympics, get to do stuff like this. I mean, I pinch myself all the time. If I took this off, it's all black and blue, okay? I mean, because after all, what are the chances somebody like me can make it to the Olympics three times? I wasn't a great athlete. Didn't get started until I was 21. I live in hot and humid Houston. I'm going to do the lose for Pete's sake. I mean, what are the chances? One in a million? One in 10 million? Probably had a better chance to win the lottery. Probably did. I just an ordinary kid with an extraordinary dream. That's all it was. I wasn't a big shot. I just wanted those little shots kept on shooting. <laughs> yeah, the little shot kept on shooting. And guess what? That's something anybody can do. Guys, you make a decision today that you're going to be one of those little shots keep on shooting. You make your dream come true too. So next time you're having one of those days, next time you're going through one of those life storms, just remember that guy from Houston, soon to be from Colorado Springs, that, that made his dream come true. Because if I can do that, you guys, with this leadership and this kind of help, you guys can do anything, anything. Thank you so much for having me.